everybody, and welcome back to History Student Reacts. Today, we are going to be watching Napoleonic Wars Battle of Waterloo 1815 by Epic History TV. Now, I want to start off by saying, don't worry, I've read your comments. I understand that this video was made before the others, and thus is perhaps of a different level of quality. Maybe it doesn't fit in with the rest of the series. Uh, it's noticeably shorter than a lot of the other videos. I've also saw that y'all have been recommending that I should watch History Marsh's video on Waterloo, um, so I will do that after I watch this one. Um, regardless, this is still the last video in the Napoleonic War series, excluding Napoleon's Marshals, of course, which I will watch. Um, it's been a fun series. I've really enjoyed learning about Napoleon uh, and all the, the battles he fought, his failures, his successes. I hope you guys have had a good time following along with my journey. Uh, I hope you guys are excited to get into this one. I certainly am, although I'm a little sad we're ending the series. So without any further ado, let's jump right into it. Battle of Waterloo. Here it is. April 1814. For ten years, one man has dominated Europe. Napoleon Bonaparte. Emperor of the French. Under his military genius, France conquered an empire that spanned the continent. For 10 years, Europe's been under the control of Napoleon, and for 20 years, Europe's been embroiled in warfare. It's important to remember that there had been pretty widespread warfare going on for 10 years, um, you know, even before Napoleon's total domination. So Europe has been fighting for a long time at this point. And as we saw in the last video, um, many people are very tired of the war, particularly the French populace, who's been going for about 20 years straight. Um, and, you know, people want to bring it to a close. Um, of course, the coalition wants to bring it to a close uh, by defeating Napoleon, which, of course, they did before Waterloo and, you know, we're going to see Napoleon's return, but, you know, I'll let the video cover that. But finally, he has been defeated by a grand coalition of his enemies. Right. Napoleon is forced to abdicate and exiled to the tiny island of Elba. While the Bourbon monarchy is restored to France in the corpulent form of Louis XVIII. <laughs> but rumors soon reach Napoleon that France would welcome his return. The French people have little love for the monarchy or its hangers-on. Now, I understand the decision not to execute Napoleon. That would be, um, I mean, one, you'd be making a massive martyr out of him. And that would also be an extremely drastic action to take for someone who was once the emperor of France. <clears throat> I do wonder why the coalition didn't send him further away or put him under, you know, more strict observance or guard him more strictly. Maybe someone has... Uh, some insight on that, because, you know, Elba is, pr you know, very close uh, to Europe. It's pretty close to France, and he managed to make his way off the island. Um, so I, I wonder why the coalition didn't go a step further. The very people whose excesses led to the French Revolution 25 years before. Yeah. He also learns that at the Congress of Vienna, his enemies are locked in bitter dispute over the future of Europe. Hmm. Napoleon decides to act. After just 10 months in exile, he returns to France, where the troops sent to arrest him rally to his cause instead. Yeah, there are a lot of sort of famous stories about Napoleon's uh, return to France, and I'm not sure to what extent these are true or if they're embellished, but, you know, these stories of Napoleon returning and he's faced with troops who once fought with them, and he speaks to them, and they, they rally to his cause. Um, I'm sure the stories are somewhat embellished, but that is basically true. Napoleon returns, and the troops that are supposed to arrest him rally around him instead. They return to his cause. Um, I mean, we've talked about throughout this series <clears throat> that not only was Napoleon skilled as a general, uh, you know, skilled... Uh, in tactics and strategy, but he was a skilled leader. He had the charisma necessary uh, of such an important leader, uh, and he could really, you know, inspire those around him. 
And, you know, his return to France is perhaps one of the best examples of that. Most of France soon follows suit. But in Vienna, the coalition immediately put their differences to one side. They declare Napoleon an outlaw and mobilize their forces for war. Hmm. Napoleon knows he must act boldly before the coalition launches a coordinated invasion of France. He counts on winning a quick victory and then negotiating peace from a position of strength. Yeah, I mean, that is a pretty optimistic strategy, given that he had failed to do exactly that um, in his, you know, last attempt to beat the coalition. Um, you know, he had been slowly beaten back into France as his position got worse and worse, and his negotiating position got worse and worse. Um... I mean, I, I'm not sure if Napoleon ever really had a chance upon his return to France. To me, it seems like an unrealistic pipe dream. Um, but perhaps there are factors that I'm not aware of that Napoleon could have taken advantage of. But, you know, it, it kind of seems like it was uh, doomed from the beginning. He targets the coalition armies within easiest reach. Prince Blücher's Prussian army and the Duke of Wellington's Anglo-Allied army. Both camped in Belgium. Mm. Napoleon's force is a match for either coalition army on its own. But he'll be heavily outnumbered if they're able to join forces. So he must keep them apart and defeat each in turn. And I mean, this is a style of warfare that Napoleon's gotten quite used to in the last few years, the last two years in particular, where he is greatly outnumbered by the coalition forces in total, but if he can manage to fight them separately, he might have a chance. Napoleon's army crosses the frontier near Charleroi, intending to drive a wedge between the two coalition armies. The next day, Napoleon sends his left wing under Marshal Ney to take the crossroads at Quatre Bras. Mm. There, Ney clashes with Wellington's army. I find an intro. Well, I'm not going to say things I don't know. I wonder to what extent Napoleon's officer corps rallied around him when he returned. I'm not really sure, because I just saw Ney, and of course, um, he was a prominent subordinate of Napoleon. And so I wonder to what extent did Napoleon's officer corps return to him, because of course we saw uh, upon Napoleon's abdication that his uh, officers basically encouraged him to do that. Many of them were saying, look, like, it's over, you know? Uh, we can't win this for the best interests of France. Uh, you should abdicate the throne. And Napoleon did. Um, and so, you know, they were not on his side. Um, or at least their idea of how things would go did not align with Napoleon's. Um, and so I wonder to what extent they rallied around him when he returned. Still scrambling into position. The Allied troops fight off a series of French attacks and just managed to hold their ground. Mm. The same day, Napoleon attacks Blücher's Prussian army with his main force near the village of Ligny. The battle is a brutal slugging match, but the French emerge triumphant. The 72-year-old Blücher leads a cavalry charge in person and has his horse killed under him. Wow. He only just escapes capture. The Prussian army retreats but it is not broken. Napoleon sends his right wing under Marshal Grouchy to keep them on the run and turns his own attention to Wellington's army. The British general doesn't receive news of Blücher's defeat until the next morning, at which point he orders a retreat through heavy summer showers to a position <coughs> eight miles south of Brussels near the village of Waterloo. Ah, there we are. <laughs> there, he receives a promise from Blücher that the Prussians will march to his aid the next morning. So Wellington decides to stand and fight. 
they were finally getting uh, a one-on-one Wellington versus Napoleon battle because uh, we have seen a lot of Wellington throughout the series, but he's mostly been fighting French forces uh, without Napoleon uh, in Spain. And he did a good job at that. But, uh, you know, now we get to see the two generals go head to head. Wellington has chosen his battlefield with care. His troops are behind a gentle ridge, which will give them some shelter from French cannon fire. Smart. His right flank is anchored on the farmhouse of Hougoumont, his center on the farm of La Sainte, and his left on the farm of Papillotte. All three are fortified and garrisoned with elite troops. Wellington's men need every advantage they can get. The opposing armies are roughly equal in size, but his is a ragtag mix of British, Dutch, and German troops, mm. many of whom have never seen combat before. Yeah, I mean, this has been another theme of this series. We've talked about, uh, you know, unified armies um, composed of a, a single national group versus more divided armies um, composed of uh, many different ethnicities and nationalities and different groups. Um, Wellington is leading one of those more diverse forces, which can be an issue um, for something as simple as language. Um, not everyone's going to understand the same language, and so you're going to need to translate everything. Um, it's just going to be difficult. I'm not sure what exactly the composition of Napoleon's army is at this point. Um, I would imagine predominantly French, since he's returned and gathered his forces in France. I'm not sure, you know, what the split of experienced soldiers versus inexperienced soldiers is. Um, as we saw throughout the Napoleonic Wars, a lot of Napoleon's experienced soldiers would die. And so he had to raise a lot of new conscripts in the last couple of years of fighting. Um, but I imagine a lot of the men would be some of the most devoted to Napoleon, and so probably a lot of his forces would be sort of well-disciplined, experienced veterans. Um, though, like I said, I'm, I'm unsure of what the split actually was. They will have to hold off Napoleon's army of veterans mm. until Prussian reinforcements arrive, or the battle, and probably the war, will be lost. Okay, they answered my question. Sunday dawns bright and fair. Napoleon has ordered Marshal Grouchy to pursue the Prussians and keep them busy, while he defeats Wellington's army at Waterloo and opens the road to Brussels. Mm. But it's Grouchy who gets pinned down, fighting the Prussian rearguard at Wavre. The main Prussian force eludes him and is already marching to Wellington's aid. Uh-oh. You know, as a another repeating trend that we've seen, uh, if Napoleon isn't there to directly lead the men, it doesn't go well for the French. Um, <coughs> this is one of the issues that Napoleon has, is that he can't be everywhere at once. And wherever Napoleon isn't, the coalition are able to make gains against French forces, and then he has to go scrambling back to regain lost territory. Uh, and so in this situation, you know, Napoleon's with his main force, um, and Grouchy is struggling to hold uh, the Prussians where they are. And, you know, it seems like a lot of the Prussian troops are going to be able to make their way to Waterloo to reinforce the British, which is bad news for Napoleon. At Waterloo, Napoleon delays his attack, waiting for the ground to dry, which will make mm. movement easier for his troops. But the lost hours will later prove costly. They'll probably also, I imagine, uh, assist the Prussians in joining the battle. You know, Napoleon's waiting. Um, what he, I don't know if he knew this or not, but what he maybe didn't know is that a force of Prussians was approaching. The battle begins around 11 a.m. When Napoleon orders a feint against Wellington's right flank at Hougoumont, he hopes Wellington will commit his reserves here, drawing them away from the center where the main blow will fall. Mm. But Hougoumont's British and German defenders cling on desperately throughout the day. 
At one point, the French forced their way through the main gate, but it's shut behind them. Wow. And the intruders are all killed. Jesus. Wellington later calls it the decisive moment of the battle. Okay. Interesting. Around noon, 80 French cannon open fire against the main Allied line. Most of Wellington's men are out of sight on the reverse slope, but many cannonballs still find their mark, smashing bloody holes in the Allied ranks. Mm. At 1.30 p.m., Napoleon sends in his infantry. The French columns are met by disciplined musket fire and then charged by British heavy cavalry. The French attack disintegrates as Napoleon's men try to save themselves from the crushing hooves and flashing sabers. Wow, and that's a credit to the discipline and training of the British forces. Um, now, we have talked about how throughout the Napoleonic Wars, the other armies of Europe who were initially crushed by France took notes and improved their own organization, training, and discipline based on uh, the innovations that Napoleon pioneered. So they took a lot of his strategies and used them for themselves. Uh, what I will say is that, uh, and I don't know too much about military tactics or military history of this era, but it, to my understanding, the British military was already uh, a pretty well-disciplined professional force even before the Napoleonic Wars, um, though I'm sure they have also modernized and improved uh, during the course uh, of the last 20 years, particularly uh, the last, you know, 10 to 15 years. Um, so it's a credit to the British forces that they were able to do that so successfully um, and fight off the French forces in this instance. Scores of Frenchmen are written down and two of their famous eagle standards are captured. Uh. But the British cavalry, exhilarated by success, uh -oh. charge too far. Uh -oh. They become scattered, their horses blown. See, that, that is a classic uh, mistake. You don't want to get uh, too ahead of yourself. Um, this is a classic mistake that uh, men will make. You know, they're seeing some success and they'll push too far. And now they're in a bad position. So, you know, maybe I spoke too soon of uh, discipline and training. No, of course, they were still well-trained and disciplined, but you can sort of get uh, caught up in the heat of battle at times and stuff like this happens. At their most vulnerable, they're countercharged by French cavalry and mm. suffer terrible losses. Among the dead, Major General Sir William Ponsonby, commander of the Union Brigade. Around 4 p.m., Marshal Ney thinks he sees the Allies begin to retreat and leads a mass cavalry charge to drive home the advantage. But Ney is wrong. Uh -oh. The Allied infantry are ready, formed in hollow squares with bayonets fixed. Mm. The French cavalry can't break into these impregnable formations. They can only circle impotently until they retreat or are shot from the saddle. Yeah, and like I said, I don't know too much about the specifics of... Uh... A lot of the conflicts during the Napoleonic Wars, but the image of the British infantry squares fending off French cavalry at the Battle of Waterloo, I think is a, a pretty famous image from European history, modern European history. So I, I'm familiar with this scene. Um, I think many of us, even if we're not so familiar with the conflict, have heard of it. Or, or seen it before in our history textbooks or in media or whatever. So, you know, this is a pretty famous scene from European history in general. Ney's failure to support this attack with either infantry or artillery is a serious blunder. Mm. Meanwhile... Blucher's Prussians have begun to arrive. Uh-oh. <laughs> they capture the village of Plancenoit, threatening Napoleon's flank and forcing him to send reserves to recapture it. Mm. Around 6 p.m., French infantry finally capture the farmhouse of La Haye-Sainte in the center of the battlefield. It allows the French to bring forward artillery, 
and blast the Allied squares from close range. They can't miss the closely packed formations, mm. and casualties quickly mount. It begins to seem that if Wellington's army doesn't retreat, it will be killed where it stands. Okay, so, I mean, the Prussians advancing on the French flank is very bad news, but the French have taken up a more favorable, favorable position against the British, and they're doing some serious damage. So, I, I suppose at this point it's still competitive, though I would seriously worry for the French forces given their position, where, you know, they're facing off against the Brits, and now the Prussians are moving in. That, that seems like seriously bad news to me. But the situation for Napoleon is also desperate. Right. The Prussians are arriving in force, <coughs> and he's running out of men to throw against Wellington's army. Mm. So he turns to his ultimate reserve, the elite Imperial Guard. Wow. The most feared troops in Europe. At 7.30 p.m., 3,000 of these battle-hardened veterans march past their emperor and across the corpse-strewn battlefield toward... And as we've seen throughout this series, you know, these were the men that Napoleon used as a last resort when he really needed that extra oomph. You know, he needed someone to send in. You know, he would send in his guard. Um, and we saw in the campaign in Russia, he was often reticent to send them in because he knows if he sends these you know, best trained, best disciplined, most experienced troops in, and he loses them, he is in serious trouble. What's the Allied center? Wellington's redcoats rise to meet them and pour devastating volleys of musket fire into their ranks. Mm. When the Allies fix bayonets and prepare to charge, the Imperial Guard wavers. Wow. Retreats. Wow. Yikes. Wellington, sensing victory. I suppose that, once again, uh, is credit to the British forces because, you know, these men that Napoleon are sending, you know, like I said, they are well experienced and well trained. Um, so that's definitely a credit to the Brits that they were able to, uh, to stand up against that and uh, force a retreat. Orders a general advance. Mm. About the same time, the Prussians recapture Plans Noir. News of the Imperial Guard's defeat and rumors of encirclement by the Prussians sweep through the French ranks. Panic breaks out, and the French army flees the battlefield. Only Napoleon's old guard maintain their discipline, hmm. mounting a heroic but doomed rearguard action. Well. Napoleon himself is forced to abandon his carriage and barely escapes the pursuing Prussian cavalry. The battle is won. The Duke of Wellington and Prince Blücher meet and congratulate each other outside Napoleon's former headquarters, huh. an inn called La Belle Alliance. Blücher thinks it's the perfect name for their shared victory. The but beautiful alliance. The more English sounding Waterloo, where he has his <laughs> own headquarters. Nice. The Battle of Waterloo was, in the words of the Duke of Wellington, a damned near run thing. Mm. It was also one of the bloodiest battles of the age. Around 50,000 men were killed or wounded, 23,000 wow. coalition casualties, 27,000 French. Yeah, I mean, that's a serious number of casualties. Um, although I will say, throughout the entirety of the Napoleonic Wars, we have been seeing, you know, seriously enormous casualty numbers. So it's in line with the rest of the conflict, but once again, just massive, massive, hum massive, massive human losses. Due to an appalling shortage of medical care, many of the wounded were left lying on the battlefield for several days. Jesus. Napoleon was utterly defeated. Unable to raise another army, he surrendered to the British. They transported him to a second exile on the tiny remote Atlantic island of St. Helena. 
This time there was no escape. Yeah, they sent him a lot further away the second time. <laughs> he died there six years later. Waterloo marked the beginning of a period of relative peace in Europe. There were no wars between the great powers for 40 years, and the British would not fight on the continent for another hundred years, until the summer of 1914. Forty years after the battle, a pioneer in the new art of photography captured <laughs> these remarkable images. They're veterans of Napoleon's armies, by then all old men in their 70s and 80s. Among them, Sergeant Tanya of the Imperial Guard. Wow. I mean, it's fascinating that we have photographs of these men um, in their 70s and 80s, so old, but, I mean, not, not crazy old. I mean, um, you know... That getting these guys in their 70s and 80s, that means there's probably a good number of them still around at the point when photography is becoming more mainstream. Um, they're able to have their photos taken in their full military garb. Um, yeah, I mean, that's it's kind of fascinating to see because, you know, we mostly just see these paintings of the conflicts and the men who fought in them. And that's what we've been using throughout uh, this series, but to actually see the photographs, I mean, that's really something special. Moray of the 2nd Regiment of Hussars. Huh. And Verlin of the 2nd Guard Lancers. These faces are a tantalizing link to the dramatic events that shaped the course of history two centuries ago. Yeah. Alrighty. Um... So, you know, that, that was a shorter one, um, as I was aware going in. Um, and like I said, don't worry, I'm going to watch History Marsh's video on Waterloo to get some more context and information. Um, in terms of this video, I, I still enjoyed it. Um, you, know, it's, uh, you know, it's a good end to the series. We've watched all the videos on the Napoleonic Wars by Epic History TV now. Um, in terms of Napoleon's return to France, you know... It, it kind of seemed like it was doomed from the start, at least from what I'm seeing here. Um, and the Battle of Waterloo seemed like basically a disaster for Napoleon. But, you know, we'll see how I feel about it when we get more information. Um, yeah, and, and seeing those images, those photographs, you know, it really gives us um, a, a real look at the men who fought in this conflict. It's really fascinating. And... You know, Epic History TV is right. The Napoleonic Wars were extremely influential. I mean, the French Revolution leading into uh, the wars that followed, including the Napoleonic Wars, you know, these are some of the most influential events in modern European history. They would really influence everything to come. Um, you know, one of the obvious ways that we've sort of seen mentioned at the end of the series was the change in European geopolitics, you know? Um, there was this uh, creation of the, the Concert of Europe, which was sort of this system where the European powers sort of agreed to use diplomacy instead of warfare uh, in order to maintain a balance of power among uh, the European superpowers. Don't let one get too powerful, um, and we won't have any problems, was basically the idea. Uh, and that was spearheaded by Metternich, who we've seen um, in some of these videos. And, and like they said, it, you know, prevented for a while uh, the large-scale wars that characterized the 18th century and the beginning of the 19th century with the Napoleonic Wars. Warfare wasn't prevented entirely. There was still warfare in the, the next couple decades. Um <clears throat> And like they showed with the Crimean War, there would still be conflict between the major powers, but there was a period of relative peace compared to what came before. Um, you know, and uh, I do think that's true. So I think in some ways it was effective at promoting peace, at least to a certain extent. Um, and the Napoleonic Wars were influential in so many other ways, uh, but you know, you could uh, do a whole, well, you could do a whole book on that, and, and people have. Um, 
So I'll, I'll leave it at that. And we'll talk about Napoleon more. You know, we've got the, uh, the History March video. We've got Napoleon's Marshals. And I'm sure we'll watch more videos on Napoleon down the line. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed this reaction. I hope you enjoyed the whole series. Uh, if you did, please, uh, I'd appreciate it if you'd leave a like, subscribe to the channel, check out the Patreon, all that good stuff. Um, I hope you guys are all having a good day today, and I will see you all again next time. Goodbye.